It's thought that 18th century English gentry and aristocrats were showing off their wealth when they served their wines from glass decanters adorned with silver wine labels. Yet these objects may not have been as materialistic as our own bottles and paper labels, which help turn wine into lots to bid on at auctions overlooking that if wine could reincarnate as a work of art, it would materialize as a work of 20th century conceptual art, like this piece for projector and slide conceived in 1971 by the Italian artist Giovanni Anselmo, in which the projected word visibile disappears into the empty space that staged its projection. Unlike labeled bottles, decanters and silver labels blend in as invisible partners in the imaginary universe wine conjures up in whatever century people come together to consummate nature's hidden agenda. Before English glassmakers discovered how to make clear glass vessels, Wine was often kept in dark glass bottles, and the earliest glass decanters echoed the shape of their era's bottles. But unlike bottles, which, over time, underwent a logical evolution toward a standardized body, a shape that would make them easier to commercialize, ship, and stack, decanters whimsically changed shape. The 18th century beheld the shoulder decanter, the Indian club, followed by the sugarloaf decanter, the taper decanter, and then at the beginning of the 19th century, the Prussian decanter and the cylinder decanter. This continual change in style led Andrew McConnell to conclude in his book on the history of decanters that during the 18th century, English wine decanters evolved more in shape than in ornamentation. A greater focus on shape that can be attributed, at least in part, to the attractive decoration already furnished by the wine label. In the 1760s, when the innovative Bealby family discovered how to fire enamel into the surface of glass, they painted an imaginary chain around the neck behind the cartouche, confirming that By then, labels seem like a decanter's indispensable ornament. Silversmiths sometimes pierce the letters of the names of wines through the label, inviting the eye to see into the transparent decanter. The tiny hallmarks, including the initials of the name of the silversmith who made the label, as well as the decorative chasings, works of patience and skill, left much unseen to the naked eye. And they left much unsaid, with obscure names like Lunel, or elusive names like Claret, or, for the wine I drink, Burgundy. Names that, by today's standards, leave so much about the exact origin of a wine up to the imagination that one can say that they were labels that defied labels. The escutcheons of household furniture influenced the shape of the earliest silver labels, such as this one by Sandy Land's Drinkwater. But silver labels soon took on a variety of forms, like this kidney shape designed by Margaret Binley with feather edge border and this curved rectangular form with gadrooned edges by Hester Bateman. Other motifs included the vine leaf and the drinking putti. Then, in the beginning of the 19th century, the scallop shell by Benjamin Smith, and in the same period, the leopard's pelt, the handiwork of the era's most celebrated silversmith, Paul Store. By 1776, over a glass of wine, the English could have been lamenting 
or perhaps secretly celebrating, the American Revolution across the Atlantic, and across the Channel a decade later, the French Revolution, events that would have repercussions on their decanters and labels. During the 18th century, as fashion in women's clothing evolved from dresses dilated at the hips to the slimmer directoire gowns worn during the Revolutionary Era, the broad shoulder decanter was followed by the leaner taper decanter. A similar change in fashion seems to have occurred with labels, as mid-century Rococo curves gave way to an egalitarian geometry more in keeping with the ideals of the American and French Revolution. Parliament. To pay for the wars England waged against these revolutions, kept in force an excise tax that caused glassmakers to make decanters out of lighter weight glass because glass was taxed according to its weight. As a result, the delicacy of 18th century decanters remains unsurpassed, an achievement all the more poignant when one realizes that most of the names of the artisans who designed these objects are unknown, lost in the anonymity of the Industrial Revolution. In 1750, a factory in Battersea started making enamel wine labels designed by the French artist Simon Francis Ravenet. The Battersea factory closed just six years after it opened, a commercial failure. But even if the Battersea factory had stayed in business, would its enamel wine labels have caught on? The striking Battersea style was a century ahead of its time, anticipating the paper labels that would give a wine bottle more than a label, but ultimately a visual identity, a recognizable brand. As English wine merchants increasingly sold wine in bottles with paper labels, decanters were relegated to an accessory role, and silver labels were doomed to obsolescence. Silversmiths must have sensed the impending doom of this segment of their market because by the mid-19th century, as Professor John Salter observed in his book on wine labels, label design was overtaken by a paucity of imagination. But still today, these objects are not just artifacts. They are more than collector's items. Accompanied by a silver label, a decanter champions wine's appeal to our imagination, helps us heed the vineyard's call to follow its path, to find something new in our daily bread, to allow ourselves to forgive each other's trespasses, and to be led into temptation.